Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Bogan. I am a clinician at the Bogan Sleep Consultants, the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, and the Medical University of South Carolina here in Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome to this educational activity on narcolepsy and the role of oxybate therapies in its treatment. What we know is that when you look at the general adult population, fully a third of them are sleepy. That's a lot of sleepy people. And when you begin to look at the differential diagnosis, of course, insufficient sleep or circadian misalignment are two big problems. But narcolepsy is right in there because these individuals are pretty profoundly sleepy despite an adequate opportunity to sleep. Narcolepsy is relatively rare, and therefore, it can be amazingly difficult to diagnose. But narcolepsy symptoms, of course, primarily are chronic, lifelong sleepiness. These individuals also have what we call state instability. So not only are they sleepy, but they have disrupted nocturnal sleep. So they have REM dissociative symptoms where the REM generator in the brain pops in inappropriately, and that helps us with the diagnosis. So they wake up a lot. They typically have very vivid dreams, and if they wake up out of a dream, they may hallucinate, or as they're drifting to sleep, they may hallucinate. So we call those hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations. Or they may wake up and be paralyzed briefly in terms of sleep paralysis. Of course, the other REM dissociative symptom is cataplexy, and cataplexy probably is around 70%. We call that type 1 narcolepsy, narcolepsy with cataplexy. But what are the consequences of narcolepsy? When you're sleepy, you have decreased alertness, the brain slows, so you have problems with executive function, thinking, memory, you may even have automatic activity, you may do things and not remember doing them. Low motivation, poor social business performance, workplace performance is a significant problem and mood disturbance. So sometimes these individuals present as fatigue or attention problems or other issues. The peak incidence is right around age 15. The prevalence is about one in 2,000, but many of these patients go undiagnosed amazingly because they grow up that way and they think something else is going on. This is just me. So there is a delay in diagnosis. It used to be 15 years, but it's moved down now that we're recognizing this better, down to around five to 10 years. We do have validated measures, and I call this qualify and quantify. So if you see a patient with attention problems or mood disturbance, tired or cognitive changes, low motivation, then qualify. Are they sleepy? And one of the ways we do that is with the Epworth score. And we do have a scale, actually, that we can use that's highly specific and fairly sensitive in terms of identifying cataplexy, and this is called the Swiss narcolepsy scale. So these are tools that we use to help us qualify are they sleepy and quantify how sleepy they are. We also have quality of life measures. The modified FOSQ is a validated technique that we can see how sleepiness is affecting these individuals. It has different domains, driving, cognition, even social interaction and workplace interaction and some other aspects. In my clinic, I actually use an insomnia index because many of these individuals think they have insomnia because they wake up so much. How do we recognize cataplexy? Well, think of cataplexy and narcolepsy as an emotion from the prefrontal cortex we think has fibers down to the amygdala, and then that in turn goes to regions of the brain that activate the REM generator. And the REM generator in narcolepsy is already overactive, so we activate the REM generator, which feeds up into the cortex. We're already awake, but when we are dreaming, we're paralyzed. So we have sudden loss of muscle tone. And it can be severe. It can be all of the muscles. So the patient can completely melt into the ground. And when they do this, they're still awake. Knees buckling is very commonly discussed. And in children, when they feel the weakness, they move or stick out their tongue or do other activities, grimace, which we call countermeasures. So we can have partial cataplexy or complete cataplexy, which is, again, loss of muscle tone associated with a strong emotion, usually short-lived, less than two minutes. And all of those help us with this differential diagnosis. With that in mind, how do we diagnose patients with narcolepsy? We actually do a sleep study at night because I told you we have state instability. And what we may see on a nighttime sleep study is when an individual dreams pretty quickly. Normally, it may take 60 to 90 minutes before we start dreaming. But in narcolepsy, the REM latency may be short. And if we see that, it's very, very specific for narcolepsy. So on a sleep study, if we see a latency of less than 15 minutes, that's highly suggestive of narcolepsy. 
Of course, we rule out other sleep disorders, leg movements and obstructive sleep apnea. But one of the key tests that we use now, not very sensitive tests, it does have false negatives, but we're testing the daytime. And what we do is we isolate a person, dark room, lights out, close your eyes, see what your brain does in the daytime. If you're making neurotransmitters to keep you awake, you should be able to stay awake. Now you might doze off at siesta time, but this is a multiple sleep latency test. We see how quickly these individuals fall asleep and do they dream in the daytime. And if they dream, do they dream within 15 minutes? We call that REM latency. And in narcolepsy patients, we'll see that. They'll fall asleep quickly in less than eight minutes. And usually we'll see at least two dreams in those naps. And we may do four or five naps. HLA phenotype, human lymphocyte antigen, DQB10602. And if you have this HLA phenotype and you get the flu or some sort of viral infection or a mono or something, your body fights that disorder, but it cross-reacts with certain neurons in the brain that keep us awake, then you may develop narcolepsy. So we think narcolepsy, certainly type 1, is an autoimmune disorder. Type 2 is a little less specific, but the HLA phenotype is not definitive because probably 25% of the population is HLA positive and doesn't have narcolepsy. But if you have narcolepsy with cataplexy, you ought to be HLA positive. And if I do a spinal fluid tap on you, I can measure hypocretin levels or orexin levels. And those are the neurons in the brain that are damaged by this autoimmune process. So spinal fluid levels are low. So what are the criteria? And we call those International Classification of Sleep Disorders 3 or DSM-5, which is typically used by psychologists and psychiatrists. But type 1, you have to have chronic sleepiness at least three months. And if we do a sleep study on you, we should see that short sleep latency and two dream episodes. And you should have cataplex if you have type 1. Or if I do a spinal tap, you should have low orexin levels. By definition, that's type 1 narcolepsy. Type 2 is chronically sleepy, not caused by something else. You have an abnormal multiple sleep latency test, and cataplexy is absent. And if I do a spinal tap, your erection levels are low. Now, DSM-5 is a little more liberal and a little more clinical. And here's chronic sleepiness with somebody with cataplexy. Or I do a sleep study, and they have a sleep latency less than 15 minutes. Or I do the NAP studies, and the NAP studies are abnormal. Or if I do a spinal fluid. So chronically sleepy with those things, I can make the diagnosis based on DSM-5 criteria. So let's hear from a patient. She's actually going to share with us her diagnostic journey, how her symptoms started, and how it affected her. Thank you, Dr. Brogan. The journey was a long road. 36 years it took to find out something was wrong. Always knew always knew something was wrong with me. When you say I'm tired, it was a fight to get me up. There was some weeks where I would just be walking and kind of falling or I would, as I know now, there's sleep paralysis. I just would think, man, something's got me. You know, it's like I couldn't move. I couldn't do nothing now. My whole body was numb and it was just like trying to explain it to a doctor and they kind of looked at me like, you're crazy. My biggest fear came true when my youngest daughter was diagnosed with narcolepsy with cataplexy at the age of, I believe she was six and a half. That was my biggest fear. I didn't want none of my children to have this. And I didn't know it was hereditary. I really didn't. And she lives with every day knowing it's a struggle and she's 16 almost and that was my biggest fear I didn't want none of my children to get past or to have these issues and neither my grandchildren but it is hereditary now let's think about normal sleep wake processes we have photoreceptors in our eyes, and those photoreceptors hook to our clock. So our clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, actually is hardwired to areas in the hypothalamus. And as you can see, the little red areas, that nucleus and neurons in the dorsolateral hypothalamus are connected to our clock. So our clock flips on, it activates those hypocretin or orexin neurons, and then downstream, you can see 
those neurons actually activate other neurons downstream. We can call those sort of subcenters if we want to, but basal forebrain, which is cholinergic, or the TMN nucleus, which is histaminergic, is activated and excited. We have pontine neurons that actually release dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. So what you see is there's redundancy there to help us stay awake. I mean, as humans, we're committed to stay awake. And you see there are a lot of different ways. The reason this is important is because some of the medicines that we use target these specific neurons. So again, think about norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, histamine, acetylcholine. At night, when it gets dark, those photoreceptors pick that up and there's less signaling. Then we release the VILPO, the blue area, and the ventrolateral preoptic area releases GABA. Gamma aminobutyric acid is the main neurotransmitter. That's inhibitory. So postsynaptically, when it hits those neurons, they hyperpolarize, decrease output, and we get sleepy, and then we go to sleep. And interestingly, GABA is metabolized to gamma hydroxybutyrate. So in fact, we can potentially use this in therapy. So when we think about treating our patients, it's important for them to understand sleep-wake processes, how to get the best sleep, what to do in terms of you know, their lifestyle that can improve their level of alertness and functionality. We have medications now that can activate these neurons and help patients stay awake. We, in the past, have used Schedule II drugs, some methylphenidate and dextroamphetamines. Those activate primarily dopamine and norepinephrine, a little bit of serotonin as well, but it's sort of like a shotgun approach. It increases release and inhibits reuptake of these neurons. The problem with these is tolerance, rebound, and withdrawal. It activates the sympathetic nervous system so we can have sympathomimetic issues. Modafinil or modafinil basically targets dopamine and it targets dopamine reuptake. So as opposed to increasing dopamine release, once the dopamine is released, it inhibits the reuptake or recycling, and so it keeps dopamine at the receptor longer. So reampetol hits dopamine and norepinephrine. So soriampetol probably works through norepinephrine and dopamine. Now we have patolosat that works through histamine. So it increases histamine release, but also inhibits histamine reuptake. So it increases histamine exposure. We have used antidepressants in the past, and the antidepressants are primarily used for cataplexy, not for alertness. Remember, we talked about GABA, and GABA is metabolized to gamma-hydroxybutyrate. Oxibate, when you acidify it, it's gamma-hydroxybutyrate. So it's a naturally occurring substance. Your brain makes GHB. And oxibate therapy has been used at night to help narcolepsy patients with excessive sleepiness and cataplexy. When you talk to narcolepsy patients and you tell them, I'm going to give them something at night, some of them are kind of like, wait a minute, doc, I'm having problems staying awake in the daytime. There are some special considerations with these medications. Modafinil or modafinil is metabolized through the liver. If we have an inducer of 3A4, we may affect its metabolism, or it may affect metabolism through the 3A4 system. And because it does enhance dopamine signaling, it could increase blood pressure and heart rate, not near as much as the Schedule II drugs, at least we don't think so. But because of the liver metabolism, it can interfere with oral contraceptives. So we need to take that into consideration in our young females. Oxibate formulations are given at night. And when we get a good response, the patients tell us the REM dissociative symptoms, the dreams, the hallucinations, the sleep paralysis, those symptoms get better but there has been abuse and misuse of gamma hydroxybutyrate because it is a sedative. And so we, as clinicians, take that into account. That CNS depressant could cause respiratory depression. We talked about methylphenidate and dextroamphetamines. Those have a significant increase in sympathetic activity, so we can see increase in heart rate, blood pressure, anxiety, tremors. And of course, at high doses, we can see psychosis in some individuals, so we watch for that. And tolerance rebound withdrawal, again, is another one. So we have to hold spin out now, probably a year and a half, almost two years. Schedule four, it is contraindicated with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Remember, it's dopamine, norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. We could see a blood pressure heart rate effect in the clinical trials. It's important for us to watch patients in terms of heart rate and blood pressure. Patolostan is not scheduled. It is metabolized through the liver. It can increase QT interval because it's metabolized through the liver. If you use drugs that have strong effects on liver metabolism, particularly antiviral agents and things of that nature, and some antidepressants, you can increase patolosan exposure, and then you have to begin to worry about QT intervals in that situation. 
Also, we have hormone issues. So if you have steroidal oral contraceptives, then we have to take that into consideration. They have to find alternative methods of birth control. And as I mentioned, the antidepressants, they're primarily for cataplexy off-label. The REM dissociative symptoms are caused by an overactive REM system. And so these cholinergic neurons are inhibited by norepinephrine and serotonin. So we can use antidepressants to suppress the REM generator, and that can help with cataplexy. But they do have some issues with them in terms of oral contraceptives, in terms of decreasing libido and having other symptoms of dizziness or nausea, or even changes in heart rate or blood pressure. A meta-analysis was done looking at modafinil, patolosan, and sodium oxybate. The point here is that when we look at subjective sleepiness, again, the Epworth score is a standard questionnaire. You should be 10 or less. Most narcolepsy patients are up around 16 or so. But when you give them drugs, you can see that the Epworth score gets better. The maintenance of wakefulness test is just like the MSLT. And then you give them drug, and we can see the maintenance of wakefulness test gets better. When we look at cataplexy rates, we see a signal there with patolosant and sodium oxybate. But as you well know, all patients are different, and we customize their therapy. And we talked about oxybate. It's a liquid. It's unique in that we give the patients the drug at night. There really are no substitutes for oxybate. But remember, GABA is metabolized to gamma-hydroxybutyrate, so your brain will make GHB tonight, and it turns off some of these awake neurons. So postsynaptically, when GHB binds to these neurons, it turns them off. So these dopamine, norepinephrine, and thalamocortical neurons are inhibited, so the individuals go to sleep. So this is a CNS depressant, and what the narcolepsy patients tell us is that when they take the medication, they fall asleep quickly, Again, the vivid dreams, the paralysis, the hallucinations, the dream enactment all get better. And if you do sleep studies on these individuals, you'll see an increase in slow wave sleep. So they go into very deep sleep and the sleep efficiency is improved. And then when they wake up in the morning, the drug wears off, then these awake circuits upregulate. So these individuals wake up and they have more alertness during the day. 80% of the patients still need some sort of wakefulness promoting medication or stimulant during the day. But some of the patients do fine just with the oxybate. And during the day, the cataplexy gets better. I would say probably in over 90% of patients. Typically, we start patients at 4.5 grams and titrate up to 9 grams. 4.5 grams rarely works, but it gives us an opportunity to see how the patients respond. It has a very short half-life and time to maximum concentration, so we tell them to lie down. You could get dizziness. You could be sleeping so deeply that you could have enuresis in these individuals. And then when you wake up, you could have some increase in anxiety. There are outliers, so we always monitor for anxiety or changes in mood in these individuals. And certainly, we wouldn't use it in someone who had suicidality. We've been using this drug for a long time. 2002 in terms of treating sleepiness and cataplexy, and there's data on the disrupted nocturnal sleep and improvement in sleep and hallucinations and quality of life measures. So I think this is important for us to consider. This is a chronic disorder, and we're talking about lifelong exposure. As patients get older and they develop hypertension or narcolepsy patients tend to be more obese, they do have a higher prevalence of CNS abnormalities, mood disturbance, they have a higher prevalence of cardiovascular complications, hypertension included. And so if you are on seven and a half to nine grams per night, which many of the patients are, you're going to be getting up to 1,640 milligrams of sodium. And it's recommended that we probably have 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. And I know if I can reduce the sodium intake by 1,500 milligrams, I may have an impact in terms of health maintenance in these individuals. So when we think about use of sodium oxybate and the sodium exposure, it's important for us to know that now we have available a lower sodium oxybate preparation. This is a calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium preparation, but it's 92% less sodium. So at the typical doses of patients with six to nine grams, there's a reduction in sodium load of 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams. This particular drug was validated and now it's FDA approved. And the pivotal trial that was done was taking patients who were on sodium oxybate or sodium oxybate plus other anti-cataplectics or anti-cataplectic therapies. 
we transitioned them over to the lower sodium oxalate preparation until we reached the right dose. And then once they were stable, they were randomized blinded to a placebo again or continue the lower sodium oxalate. What you saw was that they got sleepier. Two weeks, they got sleepier and the cataplexy began to increase. A couple of lessons here. One is the lower sodium oxalate worked in terms of sleepiness and cataplexy blinded. And also, we were worried whether two weeks would be enough, but you don't get rebound. It takes a while to get sleepy again and for the cataplexy to come back and probably didn't even get back to baseline, which is unlike what we see if we use antidepressants. In two or three days, we'll see rebound cataplexy. It's actually worse than it was at its baseline state. So I think that's an important consideration. Now, there's another molecule not approved by the FDA yet. FT218 is a suspension that has been created so that you get a time release. So you only take it once at night. It's still a liquid preparation suspension. And you can see it has different pharmacokinetic properties. The Cmax is a little bit delayed, a little bit longer. And the area under the curve is close to what you would get with a sodium oxalate. It has been effective in terms of treating sleepiness and cataplexy in narcolepsy patients. When we think about treatment options in these individuals, of course, we're asking about their symptoms, how sleepy are they, and how does the sleepiness affect them in terms of quality of life and functionality? What potential medications can we use? What are the adverse effects from those medications? You know, administration, abuse potential, comorbidities of the individuals, all those are being considered. Now, we do have guidelines. Now, the original guidelines, some of which we used in this discussion, the ASM 2007, we saw the first level of treatment, modafinil or modafinil, based on the science, treated sleepiness and oxivate, treated the sleepiness, the cataplexy, as well as the disrupted nocturnal sleep and the REM dissociative symptoms. And interestingly, you can see in the second level, amphetamines, methylphenidate, and antidepressants. These are old guidelines. The more current guidelines are evolving that basically address some of the new research in solriamphetol and patolosanth and the lower sodium oxalate. We have a lot more science. I would encourage you to evaluate the newer comments in terms of the guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So let's hear from a patient, and then we have a chance to also review some patient cases. We started it, and it was just like, okay, the first night, and then I was like, ah, oh, two hours later, kind of like, mm, nope, this ain't working. So then we went through the first week. The second week, we kind of played with the doses, and then it was like waking up the next morning going, poof, and I was just like, man, I'm awake. Yes, I do have to take my Adderall to really get going, but it was like, is this what it feels like to wake up and not, like, be a zombie? I mean, I was really surprised that it really worked. And being on it for 11 years or 10 years, it kind of wakes me up now if I hear sounds and loud noises and it's up and down some nights or if my pain levels, if it's cold or I've done too much, it'll wake me up more now. But like Dr. Brogan said, that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to wake you up if you hear sounds. We try to push it back, taking it later so I kind of do sleep instead of being up at four o'clock in the morning and then exhausted by noon. So it's just, some days you play with, okay, I know I'm still kind of a little awake when I'm usually 10, 30, 11 o'clock ready for bed. I might want to stay up till about 11, 30 because I'm still, and then it's just, once you know your body, you know, okay, my normal pattern is, it's the weekend, I'd like to sleep in a little bit. I don't want to be up at the crack of dawn at five, six o'clock, wide awake, and everybody else still sleeping, you got to tiptoe, but, it's been my life-saving drug. But the biggest thing is for doctors, please listen to your patients. When they tell you they're tired, that it's not like a normal tired, brain fog, I'm, I'm forgetting stuff, or things just ain't going right in my household. I can't manage day to day normal task. 
can't finish them. Listen to them is the biggest thing. And family, just stand by. Thank God I had a wonderful husband that stood by me. And he goes, we'll find the answers. And when we did, he was like, he never heard of this, but we'll find everything out we can and find you the best doctor. This is a 29-year-old woman with narcolepsy. She was diagnosed when she was 23, and she was placed on methylphenidate. And we talked about this before. We didn't have any drugs approved to treat narcolepsy, and many of those individuals were treated with ADD drugs. She's still having daytime sleepiness, even on the methylphenidate. We talked about tolerance that can occur in these individuals, but also, interestingly, she began to have episodes of loss of facial control, particularly when she laughed. Her high school friends used to tell her a joke and she'd just sort of fall in the plate when she laughed. No one thought that was abnormal. That was cataplexy. And we can see this. The sleepiness can occur at one point, but over time, we can see the disorder evolve and cataplexy may come on later. So how would we proceed? Would we have to repeat a test? If she had a definitive test based on ICSD-3, no, we don't have to do a repeat test, but we could consider modifying her therapy. This was an interesting study. A group of patients who were on modafinil at a stable dose, up to 600 milligrams, which is above the FDA-approved dose, and then you transition them to modafinil alone or modafinil sodium oxabate or sodium oxabate alone. The idea being, does it work when you take modafinil with it? But when you look at that, the clinical global impression, you can see there's a signal with oxabate. Oxabate definitely improved these global symptoms of narcolepsy. We had individuals showing improvement in their narcolepsy symptoms and improvement in quality of life. I will tell you in my clinic, about 80% of patients do need a stimulant. They get by with oxabate alone, but many of them still need stimulants, and the stimulants don't, in fact, impede the effect of the oxabate therapy. So how would we proceed? If she's on oral contraceptives, then we're much more likely to consider using oxabate therapy. The efficacy is quite significant in these individuals. The signal you see is pretty impressive. Remember, it does have CNS suppressant effects, so it will make her sleepy. So we have to make sure her environment is safe and there's no likelihood of diversion and she is stable psychiatrically, no suicidal ideation. So we have to educate her, and there is a REMS program, Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy, that can make sure the patient and the pharmacy and the clinician are all knowledgeable about Oxabate. It works very well. This is a 39-year-old male with obesity, and he has established cardiovascular risk in that he is hypertensive, has dyslipidemia. He's already had a coronary stent. And he was established to have narcolepsy with cataplexy. He had had episodes of muscle weakness and sleepiness. His Epworth score was very high. And with therapy, we saw some improvement. And with Oxabate, two-thirds of the patients with narcolepsy have REM dissociative symptoms at night. And all of those improved with Oxabate therapy. He's on nine grams. He's getting 1.6 grams of sodium per day. So what do we do with this particular fellow? In this patient, I would be reluctant to use Schedule II drugs because they have an increase in sympathetic activity, so heart rate and blood pressure. I'd have to monitor them. We have alternative therapies, obviously the modafinil, armodafinil, and solreamphetol, but watch the blood pressure in that situation. And here now we have the lower sodium oxabate preparation, the calcium, magnesium, potassium preparation that is 92% less sodium. So from my perspective, this would be a natural in terms of transitioning the patient over to the lower sodium oxabate preparation and then closely monitor his blood pressure response. And patolosant could help with the cataplexy as well since it's FDA approved to treat cataplexy, but also approved to treat excessive sleepiness. So we could certainly consider that. The last case, 10-year-old boy, he's had decrement in his school performance with low energy and motivation, fall asleep in class and irritable. And at first, the family was like, okay, he's prepubescent, he's getting ready to transition, and this is part of life. But they also noted that his sleep patterns had changed dramatically and that he had begun to wake up more and do some yelling and screaming at night and had vivid dreams. And interestingly, when he was watching cartoons on TV, he could have these funny facial tics. His face would move or his tongue would protrude or his eyes would droop. That's cataplexy. It's atypical in the pediatric population. And the sleepiness is atypical. We talk about state specificity in pediatric population. 
they're so driven to try to be awake that when they're sleepy, oftentimes they have mood changes and irritability rather than manifesting sleepiness. And of course, they're little people who don't have a lot of experience with life, so they have trouble explaining what's going on in these individuals. And we've not had any drugs approved to treat narcolepsy in the pediatric population until we had sodium oxalate. And a study was done in the pediatric population with cataplexy. And again, we did this maintenance of effect trial, gave patients drugs, their cataplexy improved, sleepiness improved, and then they were randomized, blinded to placebo. And what you see in this population, 7 to 16 years old, you can see at stable dose, their cataplexy frequency was considerably low per week, around 3 or so. But when they came off the sodium oxalate and were placed on placebo blinded, you can see the cataplexy increased to 21 episodes occurring on a weekly basis. So in this child, certainly I would be willing to consider sodium oxalate because it treats sleepiness and it treats cataplexy. And currently it's the only drug approved in the pediatric population to treat narcolepsy patients. In conclusion, I think there's some very important points. One is that this disorder comes on in the teenage years. It can come on as early as five years old or even earlier. There's typically been a delay in diagnosis. They don't know how to interpret these symptoms, so it takes 10 or 15 years to make the diagnosis in these individuals. We've learned a lot about the pathophysiology and the fact that in certainly type 1 there is an autoimmune abnormality, and that has directed some of the new therapy. And so we have therapeutic options. We saw the standard of care was oxabate therapy and, of course, modafinil for excessive sleepiness, or armodafinil. But we now have new guidelines evolving. And as we understand the pathophysiology and the implications and how we use patient-reported outcome measures, that can certainly direct our therapy. Oxabate is a unique molecule, no substitute for it. Nothing else really works like this. And so we got a chance to explore not only Oxabate, but other therapeutic options and how this might fit in terms of our therapy for our patients. So again, thank you for your attention today and thank you for participating. This activity is accredited by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.